Hello, listeners. Dan here. Happy holidays to everyone. You are listening to the bonus episode that we made for One Magic Christmas. This will feature interviews from the actors Elizabeth Anwar and Rob Magwood, as well as the composer from the film, Michael Conway Baker. So cozy up by your crackling fireplaces, have a hot cocoa handy, and enjoy. Our special guest today is a wonderful actor who's played everything from Alice in Wonderland to a crime scene investigator and a rebellious Martian in the animated family favourite Mars Needs Moms. But today we're focusing on her very first feature film role when she was just the tender age of five. Yes, we're very excited to welcome One Magic Christmas's Abby Granger herself, the one and only Elizabeth Arnoir. Hello, welcome. Thank you, what a lovely introduction. (laughs) (laughs) little walk down memory lane (laughs) I guess it must be crazy for you to talk about this movie it's the 35th anniversary if it's not indelicate of me to say that (laughs) no not at all in fact it's a joy to be able to say that you know for me in so many ways it can can, there are memories that feel like yesterday and then there are parts that I'm sure you're going to tell me about that I didn't even know you know it's 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 (laughs) you know I was at that age where certain things were very impressionable and other things were you know just in looking back, I'm like, oh, that happened, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, <sure. laughs> so, but it's one of my favorite things I've ever done, and and it just happened to be one of my first things that I ever did. So, yeah. big source of pride, this movie. So, Ooh. first things first, I guess. How did you get involved in the movie? Were you already sort of a working young actress and in adverts and things like this, or were you plucked out of school? What happened there? I started when I was about three years old, just from my parents seeing how much energy I had and how much of a performer I was, whether or not they liked it (laughs) Um, in in my free time and, and just gnawing their ears off all day long with, look at this, look at this, you know, I think that they realized they could give me an outlet for that. First, it was dance. And then, you know, I kept like memorizing commercials and repeating them back to them. I didn't know what it meant. I didn't ask to be put in the industry at all. It was more that my parents were able to and had the time to explore that option for me because I seemed to enjoy that stuff so much. And One Magic Christmas was actually my second movie, uh, my first real starring role. Okay, my first sure. movie was another movie that uh, called Where Are the Children? And, and, and I was one of the supporting leads. Mm-hmm. But this movie really was magic. And this is for me what I consider my first like, you know, milestone moment. It was just an audition. You know, my parents did the normal thing of contacting SAG and finding out good agencies. And the first couple agents I met with wanted to sign me. We liked one. The first thing I auditioned for, I booked. And so my parents thought that was a good sign. Mm-hmm. You know, they were playing with it. They weren't really like invested. None of them were in the entertainment industry. So um, when One Magic Christmas came along, they were very excited because they loved the material. And I went in and, you know, I got like, I, th- I think I went back probably like three times right. to read. It was still to this day one of my favorite things I've ever done. When I look back at the quality of the work that I've done, it is one of the top in the quality. And I was lucky for it to be when I was five years old because it was a good introduction to working with great actors and people who were cool with children you know, it was just a good environment for one of my first jobs, for sure. Yeah. In terms of quality, your your acting is perfection. It's it's so oh. adorable. It's so endearing. Like, you're, Thank I don't, you. you have so much sort of restraint in your delivery as well as a kid actor. It's pretty amazing. That's really amazing to hear you say that, because as a kid, I was not aware. <laughs> you know, it was very much just um, being natural in the moment. There was no uh, training there. It was purely just feeling the moments, you know, feeling what was happening right. in the moment. Right. Yeah. You're so present in the scenes, making eye contact with your fellow actor. You're actually in the scene with them at any given moment and every reaction feels so true. Didn't you have any self-consciousness or catching the camera with your eye line by accident or anything like that? You know what? I'm going to say this what, from what I remember of it. I remember never feeling like I was acting, if that makes sense. The first movie I did was very like adult storyline. It was about being kidnapped. And it was, even though I cried for real in the movie, because it was a very, you know, aggressive scene that was being done. um, I didn't have a good, it wasn't easy for me to separate and go, I'm pretending right now. It was really like, at that age, I really was just interacting with people. Mm. And, And it felt like probably one of the most honest times in working as an actor because there really aren't any of those things that you overthink you really are just like well if someone said this to me this is how I would feel this is how I would react and it wasn't too thought it was very instinctual and, and natural and 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 to the credit of the director 
Philip Borsos, who was so great, knew how to speak to children without speaking down to them. He knew how to speak as a peer. Mm. He really knew how to keep it very present and mindful without being too over aware, if that makes sense. It might seem like a, a sure. oxymoron, but it's true. He was great. And also the actors I got to work with, you know, I'm still to this day friends with Mary Steenburgen. And for me, Mary became like a second mom to me. Yeah. Her daughter, uh, Lily, and I became very close friends. We actually ended up being roommates after college. We went to college together. Oh, wow. We ended up being roommates in New York afterward. You know, there's just this long history from my life that comes from the relationships that formed during that movie. And oh, wow. good people, just very good people. That's incredible. Yeah. Working with like Gary Basaraba and Mary Steenburgen, mm-hmm. they were great actors. So as a kid, you didn't even have the ability to pick up any bad habits. Right. <laughs> you know, you mm, were just like, right. you were really <laughs> reacting to what felt like a real conversation. Yeah. I don't know. It, it's kind of nice to think back about what that felt like, because that's really where the performance came from is what it felt like. And it just felt very authentic and very real. Yeah. How was it like working with Harry Dean Stanton? Yeah. Harry Dean Stanton. Oh my goodness. That was an amazing experience, actually. I ran into Harry Dean at Dan Tana's here in Los Angeles years and years later. I was probably about uh, 28 years old and he was sitting in in one of the booths and and surrounded by his people. And I walked up to him and I said, I don't know if you remember me, but I'm Elizabeth from One Magic Christmas. And he literally melted. You know, you think of him as this sort of like, you know, I don't know. He had this incredible sort of energy and persona and, um, not necessarily the most penetrable if you're walking up to somebody at a table. I didn't know how he was going to react. Wow. He was like, oh my gosh, Elizabeth. It was like <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> he and I had this great back and forth on set. <laughs> and as an adult who uh, knows what it's like to not have the sponge of a memory that I used to, I can laugh about it. But at the time, I'm sure he was so good about it. I would mistake sometimes. Well, I didn't even mistake it. Sometimes he was forgetting his lines. <laughs> and I would. Oh, okay. It would be his coverage but every time we rolled I was just like for me that was reality that was what was happening I was in the moment and I would be hanging on every word and then he wouldn't say them and then I would word them quietly to him (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and the best part is a couple times he was like oh yeah thank you he appreciated it and a couple other times he was like i'm acting elizabeth <laughs> i'm taking my moment <laughs> oh that's hilarious yeah, yeah. but no, no malice like it was just like a very sweet sort of thing that we had together where, and he would jump mm. with the crew like here she is she's going to tell us all our lines today <laughs> like, uh, yeah no it was wonderful mm-hmm. I think Emma Watson was the same on the the Harry Potter movies if you watch her mouth closely in some of the scenes in the first movie she was mouthing some of her co-stars lines she right. knew everybody else's lines really? as well as her own yeah oh, wow. you know what works about that though for Hermione is just that she almost wants you to say a certain thing you know she yeah. wants you to say this and so she's going <laughs> to try and will you to say it with her mouth my grandmother used to do that and um so i recognize that characteristic in a type a personality i don't think that that's what i am at all i think just at that age i didn't know better yeah honestly yeah (laughs) you know but hermione was definitely type a so whether or not emma watson did that accidentally or performance knowingly i think it worked for hermione (laughs) yes (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) maybe it's a granger attribute right i like that i like that (laughs) Bad. I'll, I'll take the comparison. <laughs> <laughs> so the film has often been criticised. I mean, it's one of my family's favourites. We watch it every year. Thank you. <laughs> I love that. We discovered it back in the 80s on VHS. And yes, we've watched it religiously ever since. And one of the things that I love about it is that it is a little bit more gritty. It's a working class family. It's the people who got left behind in Reagan's 80s America. Absolutely. And what happens to Ginny is... Let's be honest, it's pretty harsh. It's very harsh. Mm. It's a dark Christmas movie. It, it is. It's one of a kind in that way. It mm. is. It's like it's a wonderful life. It's, that's what I always compare it to, you know? Yeah, exactly. But people give It's a Wonderful Life a pass and then criticize One Magic Christmas a little because it's a Disney movie and they feel that it has no business being that dark. Well, I was wondering whether... As a child, whether you were affected by it, whether you noticed that some of the material was upsetting. Like, for example, did you know that you and your brother were supposed to have died in a river halfway through the movie? (laughs) Yeah. How did you deal with that then? How do you look back on it now? Well, um, I only deal an honest answer, so I'll tell you this. Mm -hmm. I was raised Catholic. 
And my, my parents are practicing and they, they, my mom raised me to believe in things like angels and to believe that something like this could actually happen. So when she talked to me about the material, she, it wasn't literal, but it was, she discussed these ideas with me. And so I did understand the um, stakes uh, as much as a five-year-old could understand the, the stakes involved and what the story's trying to say and um, the dark side of it, mm. you know, I, I did understand that. I wasn't shielded from things like that in terms of, you know, I, my parents were always very honest with me about things. If I was curious about them, whether or not they were good or bad. And um, there was no way to do this job. You know, my mom, she turned down so many different things that I booked or that I came close to getting because I couldn't watch them. Right, you know, sure. I would come so close to things that were like just very provocative. And, and she wanted me to be able to share what I was doing with my friends. And she wanted me to be able to understand it. This was a project that despite how dark it gets and how um, real of a story it's telling, almost almost political in a certain way in terms of, like you said, the, the families that got left behind in that area. Era, you know, my parents were kind of those people. They were they were middle class. You know, they I think they related to the story in certain ways too. The struggle. Mm, it's not sure. like I grew up with a silver spoon, so it wasn't hard to uh, connect to those things organically because my mom did explain them. She wasn't afraid to tell me, "Yeah, this is what the story's trying to say." And for me, because you know, I did pray to God and believe in angels. It wasn't that mm. hard for me to consider that this could really. Every moment in this is totally possible, mm. you know, and I still believed it's Santa at the time. So that too, I was like, this movie got me real confused. I was like, it, 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 it oh, was yeah. like so close <laughs> to what Santa's like. I can't believe how good this is. I bet it's just, you know, I really believed like I was this close to what I was, <laughs> oh, wow. you know, to the reality. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow, wow. Yeah, yeah, I was aware of the fact that we were telling a very sad story initially mm. and that it was a, mm. a, a, a lesson story, a story of learning to appreciate what you have and like the lessons we can be taught in life and magic and sort of believing in, in a certain level of magic, whether it's faith or actual magic, whatever it is. Mm. Sure. It's interesting that you said that you still believed in Santa, even though you're on a movie set with like a, yeah. <laughs> a make-believe Santa. Yeah, no, my parents didn't let me get jaded or they didn't sh take me out of like being a kid. Mm. They did their best to preserve those things. And I think partially because I believed in Santa, even the, the stuff that I did where I was meeting him, it felt magic to me. Like the line between the real and, the, and I knew it wasn't real. I knew we were making a movie. Of course I knew that. But mm. I was able to tap into those feelings because I actually believed that those feelings came from an honest place and they were possible. Wow. When we shot the North Pole, again, being five years old, I actually think I asked a couple of times, are we actually going to the North Pole? Oh, right. <laughs> I didn't know Canada was so much different than where I grew up. I grew up in Southern California, and I was like, oh, wow. it's damn sure. cold here. Like, maybe we're actually going to go to the North Pole and, and, and actually get to shoot at Santa's place. And so when we shot the beautiful wide shot in the middle of nowhere with mm. the candy cane lighthousey pole thing, mm -hmm. they built that out there. And we shot a wide of me walking <laughs> in the middle of nowhere across that great snowy expanse. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'll never forget how magical that seemed, but how absolutely miserable I was. Like, I couldn't feel my feet. Oh. I was born in Michigan, but my mom chose to leave Michigan <laughs> because of the weather. And we never really right. went back except to visit family. So I didn't really uh, know, you know what that was going to be like. And I'll never forget, my parents brought me into the little trailer we had, and the generator had gone out, so there wasn't any power. Oh, no. I couldn't feel my feet. And, and then every time we did a take, they would run me in, strip me down, and just start going like this to my feet. Oh, wow. <laughs> and there were a lot of those moments on this movie. There was a lot of moments where the little California child had to be like, more <laughs> You know, we were wondering if uh, wandering around Santa's workshop was just as overwhelming and magical as it looks in the film, because that set is amazing. Mm. Honestly, to this day, I don't know that I have been on a set that felt as immersive and real as that did. Oh. You know, that was really spectacular. That scene, I'll never mm. forget it. The scene where I'm talking to Santa and I'm walking through his the workshop. I think if I'm not mistaken, I feel like Philip was really careful about not letting me see too many things in advance mm. so that when I did see them, even though I knew it was pretend and it was a set and that we were creating a story, I was just in awe of it regardless. Mm. So for that scene, I do remember pretty clearly that we walked through it one time before we shot it. Ah, they worked right. with you know someone else 
to master what the shot was going to be. And and then mm-hmm. they brought me in for one rehearsal. So I knew where I was going and the rest of it just felt so real and fresh. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, that. I have such a like. I get like real goosies in my stomach thinking about that, like butterflies. Yeah, because uh, it really was kind of a magical scene to shoot. Wow. Yeah. So I guess the question is, did you still believe in Santa after the movie wrapped? Yeah, yeah. you did. Okay, it didn't <laughs> yeah. ruin it for you. No, That's for me, <laughs> uh, Christmas was still coming, and I still had a list, and I hope I had been good. And mm. <laughs> <laughs> for me, I was, you know, I was doing this job, but like everything I was doing, the story I was telling, only reinforced the idea of Santa Claus being real. Because I'm telling a story mm. about him being real, <laughs> you know. Yeah, so, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. It didn't affect that at all. I, th- I don't think I actually, and this is a little embarrassing, but um, I didn't stop believing in Santa probably until I was like eight seven and a half or eight years old oh yeah i had a good two and a half years there where i was like santa <laughs> that is cool. that's cool. santa's coming that's a good childhood i think yeah <laughs> i have a tiny tiny question this is a very small detail in the film you have a creepy doll that you affectionately name elizabeth which is your name. Was that your choice to name your doll that? <laughs> um, no, I think that was Philip. Oh, okay. I remember feeling a certain way about it, like feeling, oh, that's Elizabeth, and I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta remember that. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> and it further sent me into being Abby Granger because I definitely wasn't Elizabeth because that was Elizabeth. Right. Uh, yes. like, yeah. Um, uh, you know, it, it's possible that I had uh, something to do with it, but I, I do think that little details like that, he was very much a part. Like he was, he was the heart of that. Mm. The Granger family is so adorable in the movie and so believable as well. And mm. yourself and uh, Robbie Magwood as Cal, mm-hmm. he must have been seven or eight, I guess, at the time. Yeah. If you said to a director, you have to direct a scene between a five-year-old and an eight-year-old, I mean, most directors would run a mile, let's be honest. But mm-hmm. the two yeah. of you are great in the scenes where you're alone together. Did you have lots of rehearsal time so you could get used to each other and develop a family dynamic? Well, we did school together together okay and obviously the way they schedule things when they're working with kids they try and keep them on the same schedule even if they're not in the same scenes as much as possible just because of the nine and a half hour rule and all that so we were often on set at the same time what i remember is that he was a very very sweet kid but he was an older boy and so like we had a natural there was going to naturally be a certain amount of like yeah whatever and like you know what i mean like we had a very sort of organic brotherly sisterly dynamic like pretty early on. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> He's just a boy and I was a girl. You know, he was two years older than me. So it was kind of like, you know, I irritated him like I should and he irritated <laughs> me like he should. Mm. I do love the way that the two of you are constantly like really excited about the other one being told off. Yeah. And that rings so <laughs> true to me in terms of young Absolutely. siblings. <laughs> yeah. I'm the oldest of five and I have four younger brothers. Yeah. And um, being the oldest, I more witnessed that with them. I was never happy when they got in trouble because I was eight years older than the oldest of my brothers. Oh, wow. Okay. But watching it amongst them and then seeing that movie, it made it all so much more true. Yeah. You know, just watching mm. the way that they just loved when each other got into shit. They loved, it got <laughs> off on each other getting into shit. Yeah. Yeah. Talking about connections with the other cast, there is some really touching moments between uh, you and the actor Gary Basaraba that plays the father. Especially that scene where um, he tucks you into bed and he holds you upside down. Like, whose idea was that? Oh, yeah, that's so lovely. First of all, like, I love you're bringing up all of the scenes that for me have, like, when I think about them, I get a little emotional because they really are beautiful (laughs) memories for me. Oh, wow. That scene, it was both Gary and Philip. They both kind of figured it out. But I think it was more Gary who was like, what if I did this? And he just, like... Before I knew it, I was upside down. He was like, grab the blanket. I was like, okay, (laughs) you know, grab the blanket. I was like, okay. (laughs) It kind of, you know, that was them and me just being like, yeah, this is awesome. Do it again. Oh, wow. You were so good at catching the blanket, though, every time. It's like duvet first, then it's the blanket. It's like, mm, it's yeah. perfect. Or is it loads of failed takes, maybe? Is there a lot on the cutting room floor of you missing? <laughs> um, no, you know what? I don't remember how many takes we did of that. But what I do remember is that they had a nickname for me. Uh, it was One Take Abby. Oh, really? Because they knew that they could get 
what they needed within a, just a few takes with me. And I don't know what that was. Maybe it was just that I was prepared enough or I was just in the moment enough or what it was. I can't, like, again, I, at that age, you can't really take credit for being a master of anything. You're just lucky that it went that way, you know? Mm, <laughs> like, I don't, sure. I don't know, you know? It's just such a lovely moment. You completely buy the father-daughter bond and that. And just, yes. just little cute things that you do, like um, after he said something about, you know, angels are invisible. After he's left the room and you're just alone in the dark, Invisible. Yeah, <laughs> just that one final line just to yourself. It's amazing. Aw, you're making me emotional. <laughs> Looking back at that movie as someone who studied film and just been a film fanatic, you know, since I was very young, I have a real appreciation for Philip, for the director that he was just stylistically, sure. you know, what he did with that scene, the way he shot it, the way he had me, you know, as much as he didn't have to go over coax or mold me, mm. he's the one who found that magic, in my opinion. I'm not going to take credit for it. But things like that, like that scene, I'll never forget how I felt when I watched him cut back to the black and you just hear me go, yeah. Like, I just think it's a very like sweet moment. It is, yeah. yeah. And it is a very well directed movie. I mean, particularly, I noticed this time around when I was watching it, I've always found the middle section where Ginny goes through her nightmarish alternate Christmas Eve, mm -hmm. how Philip chose to just keep the camera on her. So even when other people speak to her in the bank, for example, you don't cut to the reverse angle and see who's speaking. You're with her. Yeah. You're with mm. her. And she's amazing yeah. throughout that whole sequence. Yeah. Her disbelief, her disorientation, her not knowing what to do, but being determined to do something. Yeah. It's heartbreaking, that whole sequence. It is heartbreaking and it's so well done. I remember as a child shooting it and how we made that all work. And watching it later and going, oh my God, did that happen? Mm. I remember being there in those moments, but also just seeing how he put it together. I'm like, wow, wait, but I was there, but like, you know what I mean? And it's, mm. it is the way he chose to be totally in her subjectivity, not her POV, but, you know, keeping you up in her subjectivity and her experience. Sure. You know, you're just the audience is 100% on her ride in that moment. And she, if she weren't as amazing as she is, it wouldn't have worked. I mean, I remember as a little girl getting emotional. I cried watching that scene right, because right, yeah. I felt bad for her. Mm. Even though I'm a kid mm. who knows that this is a movie, I still, I, I went on that journey with the audience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It says a lot about the director and Mary. It has a bit of a note to equality to me. Mm. It's very much about the experience of the protagonist. It's not too overly stylized. It's just very in the mind of whose story you're watching. Mm. One of my favorite scenes was the scene in the donut shop because the atmosphere that Philip created really made it easy, especially for a child to forget that you're doing a scene. Mm. That just the way that he had the background working, the space was so full of energy. Mm -hmm. You just kind of like, I shut off the cameras. I didn't see them in my mind. I just shut them off. And it was really easy to feel like I was in this moment. Mm. I was talking with my family. You know, I was eating jelly donuts. It was like the best day. <laughs> the best part of that scene for me was when Philip asked me to smush the donut so that, you know, it was messier. <laughs> and then he asked Robbie to do the same. And I just loved it. <laughs> Sitting around in a busy diner and, and eating donuts and talking about our Christmas presents. And like, I just couldn't, for me, it was just like. It's the best thing ever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just the best thing ever. I remember shooting in the mall, in the shopping mall. Again, the way that he managed to shoot that stuff, it was very easy to forget that you were shooting a movie amongst, like it was a controlled environment. Mm -hmm. Things looked a little more natural and the lights weren't right in your face. Even the, the shot where we're walking through, he did most of it tracking from a distance. Right. That audio you heard was what we were saying and how we were feeling. What we, you know, It was just very, very real. It felt more like doing a play almost than doing the fourth wall just being in your face all the time. Sure. Yeah. You're right. Philip Borsos' directorial style isn't highly stylized and flashy, but it is quite pointed which shots he decides to use. Exactly. He uses that telephoto lens approach again, shooting Ginny from across the street when she emerges from the bank. And it gives it sort of a energized, nervous quality as she's trying to decide what to do. Yeah. It's very clever. Mm -hmm. Those final silent shots in her house oh. where the kitchen's empty and all the hustle and bustle of the family is gone. Yeah. And that scene where she's trying to explain to Abby and Cal that dad isn't coming home, that line 
but dad never died before which you come out with mm. oh it gets me every time <laughs> talking about it's getting me <laughs> it's amazing i mean was that particularly tough to film was it just another scene just another day yeah it, that one actually was no it was that one was hard because my mom had to sit down and talk to me about imagining what it would be like if i lost my dad yeah mm, wow <laughs> <laughs> I can't talk about it. Um. No, that's fine. It is an incredible film in terms of the emotion. And I think it's because you love the family so much. Yeah. yeah. You get so involved with them. The trials and tribulations they go through, Ben, and also it spends a good amount of time at the end showing you all the good things too. And Dan, you brought this to my attention today that the film is not just about appreciating the ones you love, it's also about giving giving $50 to Harry, mm. giving Molly Monaghan that bike. Yeah, what my dad's, the big thing he wanted to do with his life, you know, yeah. to rebuild bikes for kids. It's like such a beautiful and humble thing. And like that family reminds me of people in my own family. Mm. I connected with it because it was like, these are my people. Yeah. It's true. The movie is about that. It's about the giving and the appreciating. Very much mm -hmm. so. And that final moment when Ginny finally says Merry Christmas to someone. And it's the last line in the movie. And it's to Santa Claus. Mm. I mean, it's perfect, isn't it, really? No. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I'm, I'm, you're, you're so right. You're making me really appreciate it. I mean, I always thought it was great, but like, it's really nice to hear someone else get it on that level. So I've watched it quite a few times. <laughs> well, I can tell you're quoting it to me the way I remember it after memorizing everybody's lines, including my own. <laughs> 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 I didn't watch it again before I talked to you, but I, you know, of course, it's ingrained in my brain in so many beautiful ways. So, yeah, you're bringing up stuff that, like, it's very good memories. Yeah. Very good memories. And there's a certain amount of objectivity I can have at this point in my life looking back on it. It's almost like, oh, that little girl, that little scene, how sweet was that? And there's this disconnect for me I, where I can actually appreciate uh, it. Mm, right. Is it something that you do revisit often? For example, I mean, is it something that plays in the Arnoir clan at Christmas or are you sort of <laughs> beyond at this point? No, we haven't murdered it yet. Um, <laughs> I think probably once every couple of years, we'll mm. decide to like throw it on. If I'm with my family, you know, I'm not with them every Christmas, but most Christmases. And so I would say in the last 10 years, we've probably watched it three times, four times. Okay. We'll always watch it if it's airing. Just because it's on TV. I'm like, yeah. I don't know. It feels more special that way. <laughs> right. I think of it as a bit of a classic. I feel like it has gotten criticism for towing that line of being a little bit dark mm. for a Christmas movie and, and maybe having a little bit too much to say yeah. <laughs> for something that's supposed to be about celebrating, you know, a time when you're supposed to forget all your problems. It kind of flies in the face of that. But that's why I love it. Mm. And that's probably why we only watch it once every couple of years because it's not like your Miracle on 34th Street. Yeah. I was going to look it up actually before I came on this to see where we could stream it. Do you guys know? Oh, it's on Disney Plus. Disney Plus. Is it on Disney Plus? Yeah. yeah. You know, my show Adventures in Wonderland, where I played Alice, didn't make the cut for Disney Plus. Did it not? But oh, it was an Emmy no. Award winning show for them. And I was shocked that they didn't put it on. Huh. It's weird what isn't on there. I know. There's like a list of like 50 different projects that I think were mostly because they were shot on tape instead of film. They were like multi camera, like not high quality. Oh, and that no. was one of them. That's why. Uh, no One Magic Christmas is on. I'm glad to know it's on Disney Plus. It is. It's in All HD. Right. It's been mastered wonderfully and it looks great. So, Well, this Christmas I will be watching it with my family then. Okay. this has brought up a lot of like lovely memories. Oh, that's great. <laughs> that I want to oh. revisit again. Well, thank you so much for sharing your memories with us. You have some great memories. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that you guys appreciate the movie. Oh, very much so. Well, thanks again. Uh, it's been amazing. Uh, where can our listeners follow you and what can they expect? to see you in next thank you for having me it's been so much fun talking about this movie and talking to you guys and i hope we get to do it again the pandemic has shut me down oh, things okay. are starting to get active again but i literally have just been spending this time writing but uh you'll probably see me on some christmas movies that air during this time of year and you can also check out our subject of this episode, One Magic Christmas, on Disney streaming yeah. this holiday season. I hope you all do. Um, <laughs> and if you want to follow me, you can follow me at Lizabones2, L-I-S-A-B-O-N-E-S-2, on Instagram. And Elizabeth Arnois, which is H-A-R-N-O-I instead of N-O-I-S, on Twitter. 
because so many people have decided to make fake accounts in my name. And oh, so no. I decided oh. that my Twitter <laughs> would, would be my name, but without the S at the end of my last name. So you can find oh, me there on okay. Twitter as well. Well, thank you so much and happy holidays. Happy holidays. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye, guys. <laughs> We're very excited right now because we managed to track down the second of the Granger kids from One Magic Christmas. We're very happy to welcome the man who 35 years ago played Cal Granger. It's Rob Magwood. Hello. Hey. Hey. Good afternoon and good evening. Hello. Thank you for joining us. How are you? I'm fantastic. How are you guys doing? Great. <laughs> Not too bad. <laughs> Surprised you guys found me. Yes. Managed to track you down. Yeah, Conrad has his ways. I do. <laughs> <laughs> no, I found Rob's sister on Facebook because she is quite the famous chef, I understand. She is. She, we, as we say, she's the famous one in the family. Ah, oh. Yes. But you had a brush with acting at a very young age. So I guess the first question is, how did you get involved in One Magic Christmas? Were you already a jobbing young actor or were you just plucked off the streets? Literally plucked off the streets. So oh, wow. I am a result of Canadian content. Uh, so they wanted to shoot a Disney movie in Canada uh, and needed my role to be played by a Canadian boy so they could get the benefit of tax credits. I had been an actor um, in sort of in junior school, but like little plays. Uh, and they came to my school and said, do you have any boys that are blonde and are older than they look? And so I went through a bunch of editions and somehow got the part. Wow. wow. Yeah. Easy as that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Did you have any big ambitions to be an actor or did you just give it a go? No, I thought the concept and the and the, and the opportunity was interesting, especially at that age uh, to do a Disney movie. Um, so, you know, I did the movie. I loved the opportunity. Amazing co-stars, really good director, producer, fun to be part of. But, uh, you know, after I did it, I decided I'd much rather go back to being, quote unquote, a normal kid and skiing and, and playing hockey and, and going to school. So mm -hmm. uh, that was it for me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. So how how was it to uh, work with those actors with Mary Steenburgen and Harry Dean Stanton? Yeah, it was as I said, it was it was an amazing cast. So I think Mary Steenburgen had just won an Oscar uh, a couple of years before. Yes. I didn't know that at the time. I probably didn't know what an Oscar was. Sure. Uh, but she was an amazing actress, an amazing person. So she was sort of my second mother on set. Um, you know, Harry Dean Stanton was awesome. And to see him play that role now, it is a dark, dark role. Mm. Um, and I thought he did a, a really good job of it. You know, I think it was uh, really fun to work with Elizabeth Harnwa. It was one of, I think she was a professional actress at the time. She'd done a couple movies. So she was yes. uh, helping show me the ropes. And it was actually uh, Sarah Pauly's first movie. Right. Yeah. Um, and she's gone on to be a relatively famous uh, actress and then director mm. here in Canada. So yeah, no, I, it was a, a really fun and amazing cast of actors to work with. And then also, you know, Philip Borso is a, a really talented director who unfortunately, uh, this was one of his last uh, movies that he directed before he, he passed away. And I'd be remiss to also not say Peter O'Brien, who is the producer of the movie and who I see mm -hmm. every once in a while now. His wife is actually the member of parliament for the oh, wow. neighborhood that I, I live in. And so, oh, wow. uh, and, we, and we both went to the same high school. So I see him at old boys events and at oh, other political right. things. So, yeah, no, it was a... Nothing but a, a really fun experience surrounded by some good people. Wow. Yeah. Well, you have such a great chemistry with Elizabeth Arnoir in the movie playing your younger sister, Abby. How did you develop that family bond? Elizabeth mentioned that you did spend a lot of time doing school together while you were on set. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, you know, we spent a lot of time together. Some of the movie was filmed in Toronto, but a lot of it was filmed uh, in Owen Sound in Meaford, which is actually uh, where I am right now. So we spent a lot of time together on on the road and we had our own Winnebago uh, with a tutor oh, yes. um, that would uh, do school for us. So, you know, I think it was, we spent a lot of time together, um, as, as she mentioned, doing school. Um, and then we were also in a lot of our scenes together. And then finally, I, a lot of it was shot up here. So scenes that I wasn't in, I'd actually go and watch because I had nothing else to do. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, she, while much younger, was an accomplished actress already. And I think was very helpful in terms of teaching me what to do and, and what not to do. Right. Yeah, I love the sibling rivalry that you have, how you're so desperate to watch the other one being told off. <laughs> There's that wonderful scene where Ginny's about to tell Abby off after she's disappeared and gone to the North Pole, but she tells you to go downstairs and you say, oh, mom, do I have to? <laughs> <laughs> 
or uh, one of these days I'll be to the moon. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, that's a famous line. <laughs> <laughs> and interestingly, my kids like watching the movie now. So there's another where she calls me Jellyface. My kids like to uh, make fun of me on that basis as well. And, you know, I, I grew up with three other siblings, um, but I'm the youngest. Uh, oh. So it was my first opportunity to have a, a younger sibling or a younger sister. Oh. Yeah. Sibling dynamics are always complex and interesting, as I'm learning now as a father as well. Oh, mm. yes, yes. So do you watch the film regularly every Christmas? We watch it as a family every Christmas. Oh, uh, right. We actually, we watched it just last weekend. Oh, right. Uh, totally <laughs> ironic, actually. We watched the movie on Saturday night and then I got an email from you like overnight. Oh, uh, wow. It was like, it was very clairvoyant or prescient of you. <laughs> My kids love watching the movie. They can see me with a full head of hair. And oh, right. uh, <laughs> and actually when I was their age, because my two oldest kids are nine and, and 11. Um, oh, and wow. so I'm, I was right between the two of them when I shot it. It's fun to watch together, but it's a super dark movie. Mm. Uh, so uh, not awesome for kids, but it's a fun thing to do and, and watch together every year. Oh, wow. Yeah, right. It's a teaching moment. <laughs> yeah, in how not to act. Yeah. Oh, um, no. It, it, <laughs> and it's the, it's the only way that I can get royalties to come my, my direction is by ordering it on Netflix once a year. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sure that's not true. I mean, you mentioned that it's dark. Did it bother you as a kid, the emotional weight of the material you were working with, or was it just another day at the office? It, didn't bother me at all. I, I probably wasn't as dialed in at, well, not, still not, but at that point. Um, and as you know, movies are shot not in order. You know, it really came upon me when you saw the movie for the first time in terms of the soundtrack, the way that it was shot. You know, it was pretty dark uh, and ominous. And actually at the movie opening uh, in the card, there was a Kleenex for everyone oh. um, because I guess it was sad in points as well. Mm -hmm. You know, reading the script, I was nine years old. Uh, I read the whole thing, but it probably didn't dawn on me until actually watching the full movie. Although I did watch the car go over the bridge and uh, that I was supposed to be in. I thought maybe that probably would be sad. Yeah. But yeah. Sure. I guess at that age, you're just excited to see a car go off a bridge. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, no, it, and they actually had a couple of those cars. You know, that actually, we, we went and watched it go over the bridge. That was one of the scenes I, I went to watch and float oh. down the river. Pretty cool to see. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Especially when you're not in it. Yeah. Well, yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> Ideally. Yeah. Uh, were there any other moments of the movie that you really enjoyed um, filming or, or just witnessing? Yeah, I think. You know, one of the coolest shots was when Abby and Gideon are walking to the North Pole. Mm. That was shot uh, just up here on a on a really cool snowy night. And to see, you know, that shot and then every time Abby would walk out and come back, they'd have to look over all the snow and oh, make it look wow. like it was fresh again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really wow. give you a good <laughs> sense in terms of how movies are shot. And probably one of the other ones was when we're all sitting on the car watching the hockey. Oh, and yes. uh, they shoot a slap shot at us. And the way they shot that was they put us behind a piece of plexiglass, shot a puck at us in a, I think with a crossbow or something. Oh, wow. So, wow. And then it hits okay. and then they stop it and then turns it and it goes the other direction. So shooting that, if you look at us, like, you know, there is a puck coming at us. Those were two pretty interesting <laughs> things. But I think the most interesting was the, I wasn't even in the, the shots, but going into Santa's workshop, um, they made yes. that whole set just for that scene. Mm. And it was, you know, as a nine-year-old to walk in and to see it was really, really cool to see all the the effort and time um, yeah, that was wow. put into it and the thought. Yeah, yeah, it must have been like you must have felt like you were at Santa's workshop. <laughs> if that if there was one, that's what maybe what it's like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, did you still believe in Santa at the time when you made the movie? Interestingly, no. I was the uh, youngest of four kids, so that was ruined for me long before. Oh, okay. But Elizabeth <laughs> did. And so we had to be, we were all extremely careful or tried to be the whole time such not to shatter that dream or the, the, you oh, know, wow. that image um, in terms of, of how it was. So that was just a, a, another consideration. Wow. Yeah. But that's one of the most touching things about the sibling rivalry, I think, is that although you're getting on each other's nerves all the time, mm. when um, Ginny is about to blow the secret of Santa Claus in the mall, your character is the one that speaks up first and says, Mom, you're desperate to protect your younger sister's joy of Christmas. And I, mm. I think it's really sweet, that moment. Yeah, and I think that's what sibling rivalries and relationships are, right? You fight about the little things uh, and you try and hold dear to the things that you know that are important to them. Mm. So, you know, I think that's probably telling of, of that relationship. 
For sure. The film does have its lighter moments. And one of the things I noticed when I was looking through it just for your scenes is that you have a great line in physical comedy throughout <laughs> the whole movie. There's a scene where you're falling backwards into a pile of boxes when oh. people are looking around the house. That was so, that's the worst acting you've ever seen on, <laughs> on TV. So oh. I point that out to my kids uh, when we watch it. I'm like, just wait for this. <laughs> Phil told me, he's like, you got to fall in these boxes. And like I just randomly go down like a deer that's been shot, and it's uh, <laughs> it, it is one of the super low moments of of my very short acting career is watching that. <laughs> and I, I I'm sure to point it out to my kids every time. Like just wait and watch this. This is not how you do it. So yeah, right. uh, I appreciate that you noted that as well. Uh, but, but it's <laughs> when watching it at my age, I'm like, oh man, I probably could have used a little more training. Oh. <laughs> but there are some really good ones in there. I mean, particularly, I think the scene where you put the mop through the window, yeah. I think that's great because it's at the tail end of a dialogue shot and you don't even look, you just get it in there. I don't know if that was something that you had to have several tries at before it went right. I think it's sheer athletic prowess. But, yes. um, <laughs> <laughs> I honestly, I don't remember how many times I, I tried that, but it's another moment of just sort of backing up and my kids love watching me break stuff so i think that's probably one of their favorite scenes to watch yeah. mm -hmm. and it's also if you watch it it's done probably four or five months after it was a scene that they added in later oh, and so right. i'd been at camp and up north all summer and i had like white hair because i was in super tanned and they had to dye my hair and oh, oh, uh, wow. so you'll see it it's, it's it does not look it, it does if you look from a symmetry or consistency perspective it looks a little bit off oh. right I'm going to look at that now. The other <laughs> physical comedy scene that I was thinking of is the one immediately before that, where you are desperate to go to the bathroom oh. and you're doubled <laughs> over in agony, hopping around in the hallway. And I think uh, every young kid that spent just too long out in the snow can relate to that moment. Yeah, I probably have kids coming in right now, which are probably going to do the same. And you got to take your snow <laughs> pants off, which is a whole other uh, oh. process. But that one, that was one of the earlier scenes filmed and I was relatively insecure in terms of how I could act and what I was supposed to be doing. And they, you know, they say, okay, this is what you need to do. You have to jump up and down, knock your head against the wall. And I was like, really? <laughs> and the first couple of times I did, he was like, no, 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 no. You got to play this up a little bit more, ham it up. And uh, the other piece is it's a set. So if you hit your head against the wall too hard, the walls will start shaking because it's just a set that you're in. But yeah, my kids also enjoy watching that scene. And mm. I've seen them do it themselves uh, multiple times. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so you get a homage to it every now and again. That's great. They, my kids like to make fun of me. And uh, <laughs> this is a really good uh, way in which they can do it. Yeah. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> the one thing that my other, my friends like to make fun of is apparently I, I still brush my teeth the same way as I did as a 10 year old. So there's oh, a oh. scene <laughs> in, of us, the two of us brushing our teeth. And that's one of the few things that hasn't changed as a, <laughs> Not a great capability and ability to, to wow. brush my teeth in the way they do it. Yeah. Do you still have somebody standing on a stool behind you while you're I do, doing giving it? me instructions. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's called my wife. Yeah. <laughs> So once the movie was over, you decided not to continue to pursue acting. Is that because you had a particularly bad experience on this movie or just because you didn't think it was something for you? No, I, to be, as I mentioned, I had it like it was a fantastic experience. I, you know, I think the actors, I loved the crew. Um, I loved learning about making a movie. I mean, how can't you like a craft truck, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Being there at all times, they yeah. they tried to keep that away from us. And it was, you know, it was one of the first movies filmed in Canada that was taking advantage of tax breaks right. and a lower Canadian dollar. And to be honest, I it was a pretty big deal when it was shot in Toronto and I didn't love all of the attention that it brought. Mm -hmm. And I love the opportunity. I'll, I'll always look back on it and think it was great, you know, but it was just, I kind of wanted to go back to living a, a regular life. And, you know, I missed almost seven months of school doing it mm -hmm. and I uh, didn't get to see my family and friends very much. So I just sort of said, eh, mm -hmm. in retrospect, I should have continued doing it. Although I wasn't very good at it, but I think it was oh. a, a great opportunity, but just something I kind of decided I'll move on from here on in. Yeah. yeah and it's, it sparked another interest of mine because it was a Walt Disney movie. My dad took some of the money that I made and put it in Walt Disney stock. And so that sort of got me to start looking every day at the stock market and stock pages and all that kind of stuff. And 
segued nicely into to something else. Wow. Yeah, the career you're in now. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So you say you still watch the movie every year with your family. How do you look back on it? Do you still get a kick out of watching it? Totally. It's it's such a, you know, to be frozen in time at a specific age, I look back on it nothing but fondly. And, you know, it, it comes up all the time now, like at work and stuff, people always hear about it. And so oh. it's, it is a constant sense of entertainment for people. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I look back on it with nothing but joy and happiness. I thought there was, it launched, I think the movie, a couple of careers um, in terms of some successful actors. Sure. Um, not mine. You know, it was <laughs> <laughs> not, nothing but, you know, a good experience from my perspective. And it's, it's just fun to look back now and be remembered at an age when you kind of want to be remembered. Like 10 years old is better to be remembered than when you're my age, I think, probably. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah. And it's also a really good hearted movie, I think, with a great message. Mm. Elizabeth mentioned she thought that it might be something that would be great for people to watch this year after everyone's had such a terrible time. It's a really timeless movie in terms of the message. I think that it gets at it in a relatively dark way. Mm. Uh, but in terms of where it comes out, you know, at the end, I think is a, an extremely powerful message in terms of resilience and the, the importance of family, and I think the importance of hope. Mm. Yeah, and giving as well, giving when you can. Even a small amount like $50 changes somebody's life. Yeah, and, and to see, you know, somewhat like our family was, you know, in a in a struggling point, and they, you know, still took the time and effort for someone that was thought in more need to, to go and, and make their Christmas. Um, you know, I think that's a, an awesome message. And as you said, when Mary gives the $50 for the stove, you know, like to see that turnaround and how that changes the arc of time and history from a very small act of kindness is, um, I think, pretty powerful. Mm. Yeah, that's why I love the movie. I watch it every year. So I'm just really excited that we managed to track you down and that you were willing to spend the time and talk to us about it. Thank you so much. Mm. Well, no, thank you for doing this. It was uh, nice to chat with you guys and go down uh, memory lane just a little bit. No, you too. Thank you thanks, so much. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Our special guest today is a celebrated Canadian composer whose classical repertoire spans concert works, ballets and film scores, the latter of which have netted him not one, not two, but three Genie Awards. He, of course, provided a beautiful, heartwarming score for the film we're discussing today, One Magic Christmas. We're thrilled to welcome to the podcast Michael Conway Baker. Hello, hey. sir. Hey. Welcome. Thank you very much. You developed a relationship with the director of One Magic Christmas, Philip Borsos, fairly early on. I think you worked on a documentary short of his, yes. uh, which was his first feature, and for Grey Fox. Did you have a particular relationship with him, and was that the reason why you, you were offered One Magic Christmas, or how did you get involved in the film? I had an artist friend who knew him. And Philip was doing, had started doing shorts for the National Film Board. One about, called Spar Tree. He made another short film called Cooperage about um, barrel making for wine containers. And then they said, oh, well, I guess this, there's this fellow has some talent here. What would you like to do for your, uh, another film? And Philip said, well, I'd like to make a film on the making of nails. Oh. The making of nails. But it has no narrative, just sound effects. And it obviously needed a, a music score that would kind of drive the narrative. Mm. He asked uh, a mutual friend, who was also a filmmaker, he said, do you know anybody that could do a score for this, my film? And my mutual friend, uh, who's Jack Darkus, who was also filming, he said, you, want, you should go to Michael Conway Baker. Mm. Oh, why? Mm. Um, I think he, you, you want an orchestral score, and he's the only one I know that writes orchestral scores. So I then met Philip mm. Borsos, and Philip wanted to hear what I had done. And I just recorded my piano concerto with the, for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. I played in the first movement of that concerto and he jumped up and down and he said, that's it. That's what I want. That's what I want. I said, well, Philip, what's your budget? Well, I don't have any money. But, uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> the usual thing. But maybe you could go to the film board and you could talk them into more money. 
Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I said to Philip now, because of the first film board shows I'd done, their standard or the number of musicians that they would pay for were five. You were giving, you could, you could, wow. you could use five musicians. I said, well, Philip, my concerto, the CBC orchestra that you've been listening to has a minimum of 35 musicians. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Would you go to the film board and see if you can talk them into more instruments? So I went to the film board and I talked to Peter Jones, who was the head of the film board. How many instruments do you want for this nail film, he called it, the nail film. And I said, well, <laughs> I thought, I can't say 35. I can't go from five to 35. Uh, give me uh, 26. 26, I can do it. Well... He goes to his book and he looks through. Well, we can give you 19. Okay, mm. fine. <laughs> so 19 instruments, I had to make sound like 90 instruments. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, wow. Big, big, big flashy orchestral school. I didn't even know about One Magic Christmas until one summer, a couple of years later, in the middle of August, I got a phone call from the producer of one Magic Christmas, which had started off as Father Christmas. And oh. apparently they had they had sent the script of Father Christmas. Everybody said, oh, you've got to, it's a Disney film, send it to Disney. They sent it to Disney and Disney said, no, we're not interested. Oh, so we okay. thought that was, that was the end of that. But a year later, somebody else had said, why, well, you know, that's a, this is a Christmas film. You should send it to Disney. No, I've already sent it to Disney. They don't want it. No, 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 no. You've got to send, send it in now because they've had a change at Disney. They've got two new guys, presidents of Disney. So, all right. So they sent it in and Disney liked it. Now, Disney wanted to get into Canada. So this looked like a good film for them as a way, a means of getting into Canada. Mm. When they were looking for a composer for the film, one of the Disney executives said, you gotta, you gotta get a pop guy. You can't, you don't want, want to go these, this classical, any, you know, that's not the route to take with this. So they went, approached a French Canadian pop composer who, after he screened the film, said, but I have no idea what this film is about. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> oh, <laughs> he didn't. Uh, he didn't understand it at all. And as you know, it's a dark film. It's a yeah, here, it here's the story of a suburban mom, and it's a very tough time. Her husband is in, having a very difficult time trying to build his bicycle business. She works in a supermarket, and there is a um, an angel that comes to help. The, the angel is uh, played by Harry Dean Stanton. They dressed him as a, an absolutely authentic cowboy, but he looks like an axe murderer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I would agree. <laughs> they had screened the film with the pop composer's music from the pop composer's existing pop albums. And it didn't work at all. Mm. The, the music was not dramatic enough. It didn't do much for the film. Disney is very a uh, music-oriented company, as mm. you can imagine. Right. I mean, the, the history of Disney is music. Yes. From yes. Steamboat Willie on. And they realized that they needed some kind of score that really did the job, in their estimation. Yeah. I had done this Phillips Great Box film, I got a call from the producer and said, Michael, would you consider doing this Christmas film? And I didn't know anything about it. And in fact, it wasn't called One Magic Christmas. It was called Father Christmas. Mm -hmm. In films, often there's a contest. Name the film. <laughs> so, everybody, <laughs> right. so everybody threw their hat in the ring. I said, well, what about One Magic Christmas? Maybe that'll work. Well, yeah, okay, we'll use that. Um, okay. Uh -huh. So, so much for the titles of films. So, did you name the movie? So, I kind of named the movie. <laughs> wow. <Okay. laughs> well, well, it was, you know, everybody was coming up. Actually, as time went on, 
and we were working on the film, uh, there were other alternate titles that were offered. One Miserable Christmas was one. <laughs> <laughs> another oh, another wow. title that came because in the film, Santa takes the little girl through his workshop and she meets all these people who have died. And they, yeah. so, so Santa's got them is working in this in the workshop. And somebody else said we should call it Santa's Death Slaves. Oh, no. <laughs> Good grief! At any rate, came the time when uh, I was to get together with Philip, who had had a terrible experience with the French Canadian composer. The thing was that they they had a deal with Disney. Disney would pay for the music score, but Phillips Company would pay for everything else, the actors, the, the sets, it's all the rest of it. But the fact right. that Disney would pay for the music score, Philip was determined he was going to make Disney pay. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. So the first thing he said to me, I want it big. It's got to be big. What, what, what do you mean? big film. Well, I want lots of instruments. I said, what about a double string orchestra? So, well, how many instruments is that? Well, that's about 75. Great. Let's have that. Wow. <laughs> wow. So I started writing and the first cues I did, uh, we went into this studio in Toronto with the Toronto Symphony, basically. Mm, and oh, wow. so it was, uh, Needless to say, a good size budget, especially for a Canadian composer who's <laughs> used to mm, trying to make right. five instruments or 19 instruments sound like 100 or whatever. <laughs> but there, yeah. there was one instance, and this was in the middle of winter in Toronto, freezing cold outside. And there was a scene in One Magic Christmas where uh, they had run out of money for special effects. And the special nice. effects in this scene was the, all the lights in the neighborhood went off. Yes. Yeah. And I was to compensate when the music score to make it sound like something fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So I had uh, written a quite uh, heavily orchestrated bit for this scene. And I had been very careful with the synchronization aspects of it. And when... I was called by Philip, there's something wrong with it. Oh, oh what's wrong? With it? Well, it doesn't sink. So I went to the studio oh. and they, and indeed it didn't sink. I said, well, I calculated this absolutely to the frame. So I asked the editor, I said, have you done anything uh, different with this? No, it's exactly what you, are, are you sure? Well, I trimmed some of the, the scenes. Right, Philip. What What do you mean oh, you trimmed no. some of the scenes? He took, <laughs> he took frames out here and there, oh, so no. that in his estimation yeah. things worked worked better. Well, of course they didn't work at all. So Philip said, mm. "You took the frames out. You're going to pick them up. Off where are they? They're on the floor. <laughs> you're going to pick them up and you're going to put them back in the film." <laughs> oh wow! Literally, and that guy the was on his hands and knees picking up the frames of the film. Wow! Okay. And then uh, splicing them back in, and then when we played it back, indeed everything synced up. Yeah, right. it's a great cue, actually, that one. It really does hammer home the fact that something is changing, that you're entering into an alternative Christmas Eve. Yes. Because th that's what happens. The main character is forced to live an alternative Christmas Eve where her husband and children yeah. die. Yes, <laughs> just, yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. A, li a little dark. Yeah. And it it's quite simple visually, just having the fairy lights on the street turning off. Mm -hmm. I yeah. noticed that it yeah. has... Is it synths that I can hear sort of intoning sort of bell tones on the I soundtrack? I did, there? yeah, I did use this DX7, I think, which had oh, very, right. very nice bell sounds. And so in, yeah. in, in the recording session, I had everything you could imagine. I actually went to uh, a famous percussion group called Nexus. They had a vast array of interesting especially at that time avant-garde kinds of sounds my attitude was whatever yeah. works i'll mm -hmm. use 
uh, as time went on, I've mixed a lot of electronic sounds with orchestral sounds. And I went to a session that John Williams was doing with one of the Star Wars movies, and he had a whole section of electronic bells and whistles oh, wow. um, mixing it up. By the way, he was a wonderful person. I, I, I stood next to him while he conducted the Star Wars movies. And that was, wow, wow. this is great. Wow. And he was, oh, uh, goodness, yeah. yeah, so that was a big thrill for me. Yeah. The final thing that came that I was always very nervous with Philip, uh, I would be providing a score that would please him and which really would do the job. So when the film was over and I was back, and I'd gone through hell with this film to try to get everything correct and so forth, mm. uh, I was told, wait, there's a phone call from Disney. They want to talk. They want to give you a report card. Oh, the two presidents of Disney at the time were Michael Eisner and Jeffrey Kassinger. Oh, yeah. And these guys mm -hmm. were very tough, very tough mm. guys. And they knew their music. Philip and, and the other production office was all, they were all listening in on this phone conversation. And they <laughs> proceeded to give me a report card on every cue. <laughs> no. Well, <Wow>. yeah. <laughs> well, this is eight out of 10. Well, this was nine out of 10. Mm. And oh, we wow. proceeded that way. And they gave me a wonderful report card. <laughs> <laughs> oh good. Okay. Was, so I was greatly relieved. So I went to I thank them very much, went to the production office and they were jumping around sharing and saying, Yeah, right, wow, well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of the experience I had with that particular score. And I've had many, many letters and emails over the years from all over the world. Well, I have to admit, I was one of the people who has written to you over the years, back when the internet was young, and I was thrilled with the fact that you could find your favorite filmmakers and composers' websites, you could contact them via email. I did write to you, I think it was in 2004, and I still have Wow. The gift that you sent me, oh my um, goodness, <laughs> which wow. is um, you actually sent me the score yeah. on CD, yeah. Yeah. which oh, that's great. including a a narrated version, which I treasure to this day, and I listen to it quite often. So okay. I'm oh. enormously grateful. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. It's it's one of the rewards I think of doing music is to get that kind of response and get that interaction between what I do and, and my listeners. That's, that's a great satisfaction. So thank you for doing mm -hmm. that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I listen to it often, especially around this time of year. For yeah. Sure. yeah. Uh, Michael, I did want to ask about your approach to the, the themes of um, the score, because you use a lot of um, traditional Christmas songs. Mm. Was that your idea or Philip's idea or what was your sort of approach? I used really only We Wish You a Merry Christmas. Mm -hmm. All the rest of the score is original. And the only thing I did with the harmonica was to try to emulate, because the character is a Western cowboy. Mm, yes. I emulated the Western feel. The one very traditional um, thing that I used was We Wish You a Merry Christmas. And of course, I use it in various ways. The longest cue is when the husband is shot in the bank mm. and the mom rushes out and jumps in the, the robber's car, takes off with the kids in the back of the car. And it was very problematic. They couldn't come up with anything that worked with that. So I did this very dark version of We Wish You a Merry Christmas. That's a long, long cue and ends with the car going over the bridge into the water. I thought I heard, um, Oh Christmas Tree. Oh, I'm sorry, Oh Christmas Tree. Yeah. You're right. It's Oh Christmas Tree, not We Wish You Merry Christmas. Oh, yes. It's Oh, Chris it's oh yeah. Christmas Tree, yeah. Yeah, you're right. There is one quote of We Wish You a Merry Christmas right at the very end, and I love it because it's one of the signs that uh, Mary Steenburgen's character is has lost the Christmas spirit, is she never wishes anyone a Merry Christmas if they 
wish her a Merry Christmas. She just says thank you. Mm. So you're waiting after the the turn, the sort of the Scrooge moment where she's realised the true meaning of Christmas and she's living a better life. Yes. Um, you're waiting for her to finally say Merry Christmas to someone. And it's beautiful, the scene that's leading up to her saying it yes. to Santa Claus. Yes. I can hear you dancing around, we wish you a Merry Christmas. Yeah. Just the opening figure on being passed from yeah. one woodwind mm -hmm. instrument to another, but n not completing until she says it. Yeah. Yeah, and then no, you launch into a full statement. Yes. It's beautiful. Well, thank you. That was a tricky one to do. Yeah. Uh, I had I juxtaposed her theme with mm. We Wish You a Merry Christmas. So there was a, a counterpoint going on, mm. but it drove me crazy because Philip would change his mind. I'd do a music cue. People would be jumping up and down and saying, oh, that's fantastic. And he would come in and, for instance, I did a, what everybody said was wonderful. Santa's workshop cue. Mm. We did it and everybody said, oh, that went. I said, don't say anything to, to Philip. Well, why? <laughs> because if he likes it, he'll, he'll cut it. And sure enough, he mm. came in, listened to it. And he said, well, we're cutting it. Oh. Why are you cutting it, Philip? Because if Disney likes it, I won't be able to cut it. I won't have the power to cut it. Oh, wow. right. So that's how uh, how um, uh, Austin, <laughs> he was contrary he was. He did this with uh, the cutting of the film. I remember going down, walking down Young Street with the film editor who said, all I can see is my hands around Phillips' throat and his tongue <laughs> hanging out. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> he was, because you do your best work and somebody comes along and says, no, I don't burn for, for no reason that you can discern. Mm. That's crazy making. And Philip mm -hmm. kind of drove people crazy that way. Right, right. Yeah. You did mention you used harmonica to represent the cowboy. Have you ever used harmonica before and was it hard to score for or did you sort of rely on the player a bit more? Uh, well, I've, I think uh, I did another film which uh, had a harmonica and most of the harmonica players I've dealt with don't read music. Right, yes. And uh -huh. uh, to find a harmonica player, uh, there was one harmonica player in Toronto that everybody said, you can get him, you can give him a part. You'll know what to do. There was only one. <laughs> there was one. Yeah, there was one. Actually, a good harmonica element is just terrific. I think this is a mm. wonderful instrument that, in the same way that the penny whistle can be a wonderfully right. evocative instrument. And I've mm. used the penny whistle, for instance, in Celtic scenes with have a Celtic flavor. Mm -hmm. The harmonica, again, the association with the Western is very strong. But finding yes. a player who can do what you want it's not easy. Well, it worked really well in this movie. It did. I had a good player. Well, the film itself is a, a family favourite uh, in my house. We watch it every Christmas. How do you look back on it? Are you able to watch it? Is it one of those movies yeah. you can watch and enjoy? Yeah, I. Uh, it's one of the few movies that I can watch every Christmas. I, I share it with other people to watch and... Uh, I get a big kick out of the reaction to it. It's certainly one of the best films uh, I've ever worked on from the mm -hmm. point of view of just emotional satisfaction. It has a, a wonderful re resolution to mm -hmm. it. Michael, you've worked in the industry for quite a while. Do you have any interesting stories to share? Here's a story. When I was working on an execrable film for Universal, I was down in the huts working with um, a film editor. And at the time, they were making Jaws. And I said, uh, tell me about Jaws. What was it? He said, well, I was walking along this same corridor, and I saw Johnny, uh, Johnny Williams, they called him. And I said, Johnny, what's the, what's the theme for the shark? And Johnny said, oh, you want to hear it? He said, look, here's some piano. I'll play it for you. So he said, God, oh. Bottom, 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 bottom. <laughs> and the, the film editor says, you know what I told him? And he says, Johnny, that's a terrible theme. That's not going to work. <laughs> oh, wow. Boy, was he wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All these composers have weird stories to tell. Yes. 
Well, thank you so much for spending some time with us. It's today. my pleasure. My pleasure. I don't get to talk <laughs> this way to too many people. So it's great fun for me and great pleasure to have these kinds of conversations. So I wish you both well. I hope it's your projects and so forth are very successful. I'm sure they will. Oh, thank you oh, so thank much. You. Well, thank you both very much. I, you made my Sunday. <laughs> oh, <thank> you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've made ours as well. So thank you very much. Okay. Thanks both. Bye for now. Bye. 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 Bye.